Hey Colton, so this last Tuesday I awoke at the ungodly hour of 3.27am to board a bus and then eventually a train to Paris. I fell asleep immediately after entering the train, so I'm not really sure when I went through the channel, but now I can say that I have actually been asleep under the ocean. Paris is the most visited tourist destination on earth, and after eating a very delicious and very carb heavy breakfast, it didn't take long for my explorations to help me to understand why. Paris is a city of art, a city of history, a city of food. A city of culture. One of the sites I most wanted to see was the Louvre, home to countless works of art, and of course, the Mona Lisa. These are all the people trying to see the Mona Lisa. These are all the people trying to take a mediocre quality picture of the Mona Lisa. And this is my own mediocre video of the mysterious lady. Along the opposite wall stood this picture. It seemed like most people having already taken their picture of Mona simply walked past this one, even though it was easily a hundred times larger. I'm also not really sure why these decapitated fingers were left outside rather than in the museum, but I thought they were cool. But Colton, even more impressive than giant severed stone fingers was Versailles, a palace built by generations of French kings to show their wealth and power. From their giant beds, to their two private churches, to really fancy ceilings, the many King Louis of France showed that they sure knew how to decorate. And while the grandeur was unmistakably beautiful, I was reminded that this lavish living was facilitated by a system of oppression. Many citizens of Paris starved, while their king covered the thousands of rooms in his house from floor to ceiling in granite, art, and gold leaf. Outrage to this disparity eventually led to the tragedies, triumphs, and horrors that were the French Revolution. After that revolution succeeded and then fell into chaos, an ambitious general, Napoleon, would name himself Emperor and nearly conquer the known world. The chain of history can be weird sometimes, because one man cared more about pretty things than feeding his own people. Another ambitious man, a generation later, had the resources to accomplish his dream of building an empire that would rival Rome, a failed campaign that would define so much of history. Colton, it was in the Orsay Museum that I came across a full floor of impressionist artwork. I found a Monet, and another Monet, and another Monet. I seem to like Monet. I don't really understand art, but I'm always amazed by how impressionists use hundreds of dots of different colors rather than brush strokes to create their works. If you look too close at any one portion of the painting, it simply looks like a blob. But if you stand back and see the work as a whole, a beautiful image comes into view. Outside the museum, I ran into this friendly rhino and a Frenchman who was looking for directions. For some reason, I may have looked like something other than a tourist, but no matter what I looked like, it couldn't change the fact that I don't speak French. But Colton, it wasn't until entering the catacombs, stories below the streets of Paris, that its history came alive to me. In the disorienting darkness, there are estimated to be the remains of six million people, arranged atop one another row by row. As the city grew, available land for burials was scarce and millions of ancestors of Paris were moved to these catacombs to make room for new arrivals to the churchyard. Amidst the fascinating horror of it all, I caught myself wondering if Stephanie and Albert were still together and if they actually thought that a hallway occupied by millions of dead bodies was an appropriate location to manifest their love. It also struck me that a city can hide its past, its history can be tucked away under layers of earth, but the skeletons are still there. They will always be there. The past demands to be dealt with, to be acknowledged, and while the past can't be escaped, people with a unique vision can take the skeletons that wouldn't fit in the closet and can arrange them in a form of art so grotesque it approaches beauty. Colton, in an odd way, I felt proud of Paris for taking its skeletons and making them, if not beautiful, at least inspiringly memorable. And Colton, later that night, as I stood upon the triumphal arch that Napoleon Bonaparte built to honor his own success, I couldn't help but think of these words that Napoleon himself is supposed to have said. What is history but a fable agreed upon? And as I stood atop that arch, the city of lights twinkling beneath me, I had to wonder, who would have thought that an 18th century Frenchman would try to recreate the glory of the Roman Empire? Who would have thought that six million skeletons could be beautiful? Who would have thought that a strange looking tower made of thousands of dark iron beams, the Eiffel Tower could have became an international symbol for romance. And who would have thought that me, a random kid from Las Vegas, would get to experience it all? And if history is just a fable that we agree upon, then what does that make the future? And what fable should I use my life to tell? Hope you're having a good week, Colton. And just so you know, I'm going to bed.